Kim, welcome. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in lovely Berkeley, California, and I'd just like to thank the organising committee for the honour of um, this keynote. It, it's, it really is a great honour to be able to speak to you. As you can see up here, what I'm going to talk about today is I am going to talk globally about my experiences when I went on a bit of a trek around the world, and I'll share um, some of the learnings that I had from that trip. And, uh, and before I, I start, I just want to acknowledge that today in Australia is Anzac Day. And Anzac is, Day is the National Day of Remembrance for Australians and New Zealanders who served and died in wars and conflicts, and which actually started with World War I globally and remembering um, those who served there. So I just want to acknowledge that and to all the Australians that are here. This is actually a picture that the uh, Mental Health Council of Australia put out uh, in the year 2000, which is when I started my PhD. And um, I really, I felt the message was really pertinent for me and maybe for other people. Because this is a picture of the flannel, flannel flower. And the flannel flower is um, the symbol for mental health awareness in Australia. And, uh, and it's, it's a bush native flower. And they chose it because in Australia, as you might know, we have a lot of extremes of weather and of landscape. And so the flannel flower has to be adaptable and endure in order to survive in that landscape. And so I think for me, regardless of my history and my background, which was, you know, a very difficult one and a very unusual um, childhood, I needed to find a way forward um, in my life. I think the thing too is that I, out of my childhood, I, um, I was very determined. Um, I came out of it thinking, I want something more for myself and for my life than what I've had. And so that really has seen me through, I think, a lot of uh, difficult times. And so um, the flannel flower, you know, uh, the message of World Mental Health Day in 2000 was empathy, resilience, strength and awareness. And so for me, I, I needed to learn, um, I think, from my mother, empathy. I had not a close relationship with my mother. Our family is still not a close family. It's quite a fractured family. And I had to learn to see my mother from an adult's eyes rather than a child's eyes. And to, to you know, have respect for her resilience. I mean, she had an amazing story herself. And to be homeless for many, many years. And then to be able to come through that and to live successfully and independently is, you know, a wonderful achievement. So, um, oh, for me, this symbol was important and it was interesting because it was the year I started my PhD. And I was working as a lecturer at university and I was thinking about doing a PhD, but I wasn't sure what I would do. And I was talking with a friend of mine one day, a colleague, and she said, how's your mum? So I was telling her about my mum and she said, you know what, why don't you do that for your PhD? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> And she said, well, why don't you look at what it was like to grow up with a parent with mental illness? And I said, oh, okay, I'll check it out. <laughs> so I went to the literature and it was, I have to tell you, I, even though I was an academic, I was amazed at the immense body of work that had happened in this field that I had no awareness of and had never known about. Uh, the work on prevalence and on risk and, uh, but very little work on what was it actually like, how did people actually grow up and um, survive and thrive and cope with these situations. So that's what my PhD was. I talked with adult children about their experiences of growing up with a parent with a serious mental illness and I included my own experience in the PhD because I felt if I didn't, there would, it would have been a, dis a dishonesty in my, um, in my PhD. So I then, um, as part of the process, I've become, over many years and out of the PhD where I came across the work on resilience, I was very interested in the, in the idea of how is it that people in such 
difficult circumstances in, with mental illness, how do parents, how do children, how do families actually not just survive those experiences, how do they thrive? And how is it that we can help them to do that? And so that's really, I guess, been the driver for a lot of my work and my interest in the field. As part of my Churchill, I went over to um, the Resilience Research Centre in Halifax in Canada. Michael Unger and his colleagues have done a lot of work on resilience. And I was very interested in his perspective on resilience. And this is a definition that he has. And I felt, in terms of parental mental illness, that it had a lot of resonance for this work. Because he sees resilience not just about individuals. A lot of the work that's been done on resilience has been about you know, how does the individual cope. But his perspective says it's not just about who we are and our personality and our life experience. It's our capacity to navigate or find our way to the cultural, the social, the psychological and the physical material resources that can sustain us and uh, in our well-being. And also our ability, both as individuals and as a group, as a collective, um, to negotiate for those resources in ways that are culturally meaningful. And he's done a lot of work internationally with young people at risk, including young people with parents with mental illness, across about 14 countries to date. And so this has come out of that work. And what he says is that for young people to be resilient, they, there are seven tensions that they need to resolve in order to, um, to do that. And there is no one particular pattern in how young people can manage to negotiate that. But what, I've circled a couple of things here because in his work and in his latest research, he said a couple of things. He said the one significant factor in their um, statistical analysis of all the factors that contributed to these young people's resilience was respectful, engaged relationships with um, workers who met their needs, that that was the one significant um, factor. And that it was those relationships that actually supported those young people. And so, um, although the work is not just on um, young people with parents with mental illness, it's inclusive of that. And for me, I, I felt that was a, a useful approach going forward. So I'm just going to talk um, now about the Churchill and, and, and why I went about it and some of the programs and practices around the world with COPME, Children and Parents with Mental Illness, and FATME, Families um, of Parents with Mental Illness. And this is a picture of me in Halifax, Canada, where I came out of the hotel and went down the street and thought, oh, that, that man looks familiar. <laughs> And it's actually a picture, a picture, I don't know, it's a very big statue of Winston Churchill and apparently there are three of these statues around the world. One is in London and another in Europe. And Winston Churchill, as you probably know, was, was a former Prime Minister of Britain. And so the Churchill Trust has been established in a few of the Commonwealth countries, including Australia, because in 1962 the Duke of Edinburgh in Britain went to Sir Winston and he said, what type of memorial would you like so that we can remember you, the world can remember you? And um, Sir Winston said, well, look, you know, I know I've got all these statues and that's wonderful, but what I'd like is something like the Rhodes Scholarships, but available to people on a much wider basis. So the Churchill Fellowship is a travel fellowship that um, enables Australians to travel around the world and learn about an issue of importance to the Australian community and bring back their findings to Australia to benefit um, Australia. And so I was really fortunate to get one of these fellowships. And I chose to, my topic was to investigate programs for building resilience in children and families where parents have mental illness. And I went to the US, um, to, uh, to the East Coast, uh, Canada and, and the Netherlands because um, I knew that there were world leaders in this field that I wanted to learn from. And so, um, this is a map. Some faces here you might recognise. They're all very flattering photos. I hunted high and low for them. Um, at the time I lived in Sydney. I now live in Canberra, which is a bit south of Sydney. Um, so you can see I went on a very long trek. It was over six weeks. 
And I start, actually started my fellowship at the Vancouver Conference in 2012. And then I met with, in, over that period of time, I met with 52 people. So these were young people with mental illness. These were young people with parents with mental illness. Parents themselves, clinicians, practitioners, administrators, researchers. Uh, and I really uh, was asking the question, you know, what, what does resilience mean to you and what is the work that you believe is important for um, this group? And so I, I really, it was a great um, opportunity and as you can see there's Rob over there in Vancouver and I had several people that I had become aware of in the international field who facilitated that trip. And so Rob um, facilitated my visit in Vancouver. Then I went over across the other side of Canada, and that is Michael Unger and Linda Liebenberg at the Resilience Research Centre in Halifax. And then I went down to Boston, and I met with Professor Bill Beasley and Dr Tracy Gladstone. And I also went out um, and spent time with Tony Wolfe and Chip Wilder out at the Employment Options. Um, and I also met with um, Joanne Nicholson, who has a research um, and practice partnership with Tony. And uh, then I went across to the Netherlands, where Dr. Karen Van Dusen facilitated my visit over there. And then I had a holiday in Europe, and I went to you about that. Um, it was great. And then I came home. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit before I start on the trip, you know, where I'm coming from, from an Australian perspective. Um, you will have heard, of course, about the COPME initiative in Australia. This is um, a snapshot of the website. And uh, I'm fortunate to be on the national reference group for the COPME initiative. I represent the Australian College of Mental Health Nurses on that initiative. And that was where I found out about our international leaders and that's how I selected my, my trip, basically. So in Australia, we have national mental health policy that recognises at-risk groups, including COPME. We've been very fortunate to have been funded in Australia over many years, since uh, 20, 2001, for what's known as the National Copney Initiative. And um, although we have to uh, uh, look for funding every two to three years as funding rounds, and it's chaired by Phil Bronson, who's here today. And it's been a very successful initiative because its brief has been to develop information, resources and workforce training for the workforce in Australia. Uh, it's also had a brief to advocate on behalf of children and families to help reduce stigma around parental mental illness and to work to improve um, child and family outcomes. Also been very successful in developing a research partnership and so there's a now a um, building body of evidence on the work that is happening in Australia. And um, it's... Uh, I think the strength of the COPME initiative is its inclusivity. So we have consumer representatives who are instrumental in shaping the agenda. Um, we have family input and we have professionals, practitioners, researchers and administrators. And so um, you will hear again about the COPME initiative, but I just thought it was important to sort of um, uh, flag that with you. And if you go onto the website, you'll see there's a lot of online resources that have been developed. Um, some wonderful resources and also lots of information for all the, those groups that I talked about. So I just want to share with, I, I had to pick and I, I have to apologise up front because I, I met with so many people and went to so many programs I can't possibly cover all of them, but I did pick a range of programs that illustrate some of the wonderful work that's happening around the world. And so when I was in Canada I met with a lot of people but one of the programs um, that I, um, I went to was in Vancouver and the facilitator was Ros Walls and she is a wonderful woman who um, was very eloquent in her, um, her view on the work that they were doing there and she facilitated the Richmond model which was, I was impressed by the model because it was so grounded in the community. So it was, had, had community consultation. It had been built from the community itself, what the needs were of that um, particular area. And the view of the program is that social support is integral to recovery. And that was a message that really repeatedly came up as I went round on, on the trip. 
They have a number of programs, and I'll put some of them up here. The Resilient Kids Group um, for 8 to 12 uh, year olds, where parents can also attend the group. And uh, the Resilient Youth Group um, Family Fun Nights, where families can get together and network with each other. Super Saturdays, which are fun days and sound great, Super Saturday. Um, but the programs basically act as a foundation for building a sense of belonging and being valued. So for the children and for families. And this was a message in many of the programs. And it's a simple message, but a very important one. You know, social belonging for a lot of people who've been um, marginalised for, by mental illness and parental mental illness is significant and a crucial aspect of recovery. And so this was very successfully collaborated by staff from Vancouver Coastal Health. It was a, a good illustration of partnership. So the Ministry of Children and Family Development were involved, Richmond Addiction Services and other community partners. So it was an intersectoral uh, collaboration and so um, had been running very successfully. So in terms of Canada more broadly, um, I was only in BC, which is British Columbia, British Columbia, but um, it, it was a time that I, there was a lot happening when I was there in 2012. Had a very strong regional strength focused policy and I was impressed by that because the policy then enabled the rollout of a lot of other things. Um, there was very strong policy implementation in BC. Uh, they had a systems perspective in their programs in health services. And some of the practices, I spoke with a lot of clinicians and some of the key messages that came up, including I had a, a wonderful conversation with Rob Lees and he said, you know, what's really important in this work is that we look at what's right rather than what's wrong. That we don't always focus on the problems. And he said the messages we need to give to kids are they didn't cause it, they can't change it, and I can care for myself. And so um, a lot of the practitioners that I spoke with were focusing on working with families uh, with the complexity of, of families with mental illness and um, looking for strengths in families. And there was a really key story that a clinician told me that really stayed with me because I said to her, how, what do you think a resilient child is in this situation? And she said, um, we need to look for strengths in a family and how they got through difficulties. And she said, for example, I've got um, a young boy um, whose mother pawns his PlayStation every month so to feed the family. And she said, and she buys it back when she gets a cheque. And she said, you know, if you look at that in one way, you, you would see that as a negative. She said, but that child is proud that he can contribute to the family and he's proud of his mother for providing. And I thought, it was such a powerful story of how to see resilience in the face of what is a lot of adversity. Now in Canada there, there's regional policy but there isn't um, national policy on um, Cockney and families and in many countries um, there aren't. And so that's one of the issues I guess I was looking at was what was happening around policy and how that was influencing programs. So I'm going to move now um, to the Netherlands and uh, these are a couple of different programs uh, when I visited uh, with Karen and her colleagues. And uh, Karen Van Dusen, as many of you will know, uh, has a long history of doing research and practice in this area. And she had talked to me at the time about a program called Pink Cloud. And this was focusing on preventing postpartum depression. So it wasn't working postpartum, it was working um, when, uh, when women were pregnant. And so it was to try to prevent um, the development of um, depression in, in women. And so the theory that the intervention is based on is that if the mother is, is okay, then we can build resilient children. And that's a, obviously a, a strong message of many programs. So it's an online program. Uh, it uses psychoeducation, including mindfulness, uh, stress management, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, and uh, focuses on the relation, building that relationship between mother and child. And then on the other hand, um, I also met with Louisa Drost and her colleagues who um, run an online program called Survival Kid uh, for young people. And it's been very successfully run in the Netherlands for uh, several years. 
So it's education and support for young people who might otherwise go and, and speak to a therapist or seek support. They run online chat sessions and what was really interesting, I went out to one of the forensic services. They have actually adapted um, survival kit for a forensic setting because they talked about you know, the double stigma of the criminal justice system and parents with mental illness and the need, um, they recognised that the need to support those children, those young people. So there are a couple of examples of very successful programs and there were many, many others in the Netherlands. And what was so impressive about the Netherlands and what I was so amazed by was that um, they have a parallel prevention and mental health service system in the Netherlands. So they have a strong government policy on prevention and that's um, really enabled the rollout of a systematic network of programs across the country for, e for every different age group. And I met with several um, team members who talked about how they work across adult mental health services, prevention services and child and youth services. And so it was really, um, really impressive. So they have built an extensive range of interventions across many age groups and situations. Now, as Karen um, has um, also let me know, the, um, the issue, of course, is always around funding and policy. And so um, whilst those remain, the funding has dropped off a bit around prevention. And so, you know, that's an ongoing challenge as it is for many countries in this area. And so I'm going to finish with the US because I'm here, we're here. Um, and the US um, also has some world leaders in, in, in COPME and FATME. And I visited with um, Tony uh, at Employment Options, which was um, a fabulous program. It was such a, an inclusive program. It's a wraparound model, so it addressed every aspect of young people with mental illness lives and their families, including parents with mental illness. It, there was also legal representation, so there was actually a lawyer who worked with employment options over a long period of time to help parents who were fighting for custody of their children, who, to give them advice and support them through that process. They had paid parent peers, so parents with mental illness were working alongside other parents and they were paid staff members and family coaches, and a very strong practice and research partnership between uh, Joanne Nicholson and, and Tony. And the basis of, of that program was, um, the premise was every parent wants to be the best parent they can be, and, we, and parents, we can't separate parenting from the rest of our life and from recovering. And so um, it was really, I met with a lot of people, young people with mental illness and parents, and, and number of staff at that, um, at that program. It was a very impressive um, program. And then I also met with uh, Professor Bill Beersley and uh, Tracy Gladstone um, around their work, very famous interventions that I'm sure many of you will be aware of. The Family Talk Intervention is a prevention intervention for um, parental depression and it includes sessions with parents and children. And there's online training, you, you, you uh, will probably be aware it's been adapted and rolled out in several countries, including Australia, where we're trialling an adaptation of that at the moment, uh, and also in Finland. And um, when I was talking with them there, they, they were talking about, you know, what makes a resilient child? Was like, that was my question, you know, what, what's a resilient child? And they said resilient child characteristics are that they're active and motivated that they have good social support and that they have good self-understanding. So in other words, they, they have a realistic awareness of the problems they're facing. And so that was the focus really of um, that very successful evidence-based program. So in the US, um, as I said before, I was attracted to the work that was here because it, was world, it is world-leading work. Um, and these programs are being rolled out in, uh, across many countries, there's built a huge evidence base for the effectiveness of those interventions. And I was also impressed by the partnerships that have been developed here between consumers and families and practitioners and how effective those have been. Um, many um, practitioners also spoke about the fact that whilst there were areas where there was strong prevention and mental health services, there, there were other areas that were not. 
and one of the limitations around a lot of these services was the lack of availability of whole family services. So, you know, an example like employment options as a whole family service. And that there isn't overriding um, federal policy recognising um, Cockney as a group. So, um, again, similar to several other countries. So just to sort of, I, I guess, um, come to pull it together, I, I was talking with Dr Kate Beeble, who also works with Tony and uh, Joanne, and she is a very eloquent um, person and we were talking about, you know, about parenting and about families and she said, you know, the thing about all of this work is it's, it's not cheap work to do um, and it's difficult and challenging work and so it can be difficult and challenging to get funding and support for it. But she said the reality is parenting um, touches everyone, whether it's being parented or, or being a parent. And so that can be very provocative for a lot of people, both for workers and, and um, for families. And it, it can be challenging, but, but the work um, is incredibly rewarding. And she said that the issue that we face in, these, in services is that the complex tapestry of these families don't fit traditional structures. And so many countries talked about the difficulty with trying to work with families within structures that were focusing often on individuals. So just to, um, to conclude, I um, recently, um, this is the most recent meta-analysis of the prevalence of and risk um, for children with parents with serious mental illness. And Razik and colleagues in, in Canada found that 32% of children with a parent with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder or major depression are at risk themselves of a serious mental illness and 55% of those children are, are at risk of any mental illness. So that is an even increased risk from um, some previous um, studies that have um, been done and they did a meta-analysis of family high-risk studies. So, you know, this is a major public health issue that we're looking at children and families with parents with mental illness. And it's, you know, what, what we have as an international community is a collective, I believe, and sustained commitment to prevention and intervention. There were many heroes and leaders across the world who've really driven this work over many years. And one of the issues I think we've got to look at is um, how do we capacity build and sustain the work over the long term? And these are some of the questions starting the conversation at this conference that, that I think people are, are looking to address. We're, we're building a critical mass of evidence um, to inform policy and practice. And uh, we have an immense opportunity, as we know, to prevent that cycle of mental illness. Um, and there was a meta-analysis recently that showed that 40% reduction in the risk of mental illness in children when we um, introduce these interventions, a 40% reduction. You know, so it's a very effective work that everyone um, is doing. But I was left with the conclusion after talking with many people and going to many countries that um, without policy and without funding, that work is always in jeopardy. And so it really is crucial, I think, for us um, as a collective to be uh, working um, closely with policy and funding bodies to, um, to support that. So I'd just like to thank you very much. And